Military murder is an independent project and is not endorsed by the Department of Defense or any military component. The views expressed are those of the host. The content of this podcast is not meant to be legal or medical advice. Warning, this episode contains graphic details of murder and is not suitable for young listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back, True Crime Army. I am your host, Margot, and this is Military Murder, a show where I focus on crimes committed by military members and veterans. But don't worry, you don't have to know anything about the military to listen, I promise. You just have to be a true crime enthusiast, and if that's you, welcome home. Welcome, welcome, old and new listeners alike. Before I begin today, just a few announcements. I know many of you have been asking me about challenge coins because I do have them, and in my personal opinion, they're pretty bad A. But up until now, they have been reserved for my top two tiers in the Patreon fan club. But that's no longer the case. While they are still not available to the masses, for the month of May, I'm testing something out. I'm going to allow my patrons to purchase one challenge coin each. I'll have more information in my Patreon fan club, so be sure to check it out sometime today. You can find my Patreon at patreon.com slash military murder. If you're wondering why I even have a Patreon, well, because as you all know, I left active duty about a year ago and I want to continue to produce this show. I have other ideas on expanding, even new shows, but I just don't have the bandwidth to do that all on my own. So if this little thing continues to grow, then I can grow as well. So if you're interested in supporting the show and seeing it grow and potentially adding new shows, make sure you check out the Patreon fan club some point today. Oh, one more thing. If you're joining me on the day that I release this episode on Monday, I am going live tonight on TikTok. So meet me there at 9 p.m. Central. My TikTok handle is Military Margot with a T at the end. All right, on with the show. Today's case is not for the faint of heart. And listen, it involves kids. It involves rape. It even involves child pornography. Straight up, I would never discourage anyone from listening to my show. But today's episode is just not for everyone. Hell, Honestly, it's hardly for me, but these are the cases that keep me up at night and they must be told. As a mother of three daughters, this case makes me so, so sick to my stomach. But the sad truth is that military prisons are filled with primarily sexual predators, many of them child sexual predators. And to be honest, they scare me more than murderers. That being said, you have been warned. Do not at me later to complain or anything like that. Things are gonna get graphic, things will get uncomfortable. So there we go. Join me today as I tell you about the 1993 disappearance of nine-year-old Angie Hausman. Now, let's dig in. My sources for this episode include articles from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, Washington Post, reporting by KSDK, Five on Your Side, and Local News 8. I also watched the press conference involving this case, an IDTV show called On the Case with Paula Zahn, and a YouTube video by Sleuths Investigate. Now, don't you worry, this person, Sleuths Investigate, did have newspaper clippings to show her research. Thursday, November 18, 1993, was like any old day in the small town of St. Anne, Missouri. St. Anne, just to place it for everyone, is in North St. Louis. One of the residents of St. Anne was nine-year-old Angie Marie Hausman. She lived with her mom, 29-year-old Diane Bone, her stepfather, 34-year-old Ron Bone, and her two-year-old baby brother, Ron Jr. Thursday was a school day, and Angie always took the bus to school. In 1993, Angie was in the fourth grade in Rittenhour's Booter Elementary School. That day, she made it to school, and it was business as usual. At the end of the day, She loaded on the bus and the bus dropped her off about a half block from her house. Eight houses, if you want to be real specific. She had to walk a mere eight houses to get to her house. News reports differ if drop off was at 3 or 4 p.m., but in any event, all of the kids got off the bus and Angie headed home walking north on Wright Avenue. Ron, Angie's stepfather, arrived home close to 5 p.m., and when he walked in the house, He was used to seeing Angie's backpack, or at least he'd hear her somewhere in the house. But on this particular day when he got home, it was eerily quiet. His wife and his son were sleeping, 
but Ron immediately went to wake Diane up to ask about Angie. Diane was startled, not having realized that Angie never made it home from school that day. They immediately bundled up because it was cold outside, and then they headed into the neighborhood to look for Angie. They started looking and asking other neighbors if they had seen her, and kids who were on the bus that day, they remembered her getting off the bus. As Diane and Ron were looking for Angie, panic started to set in as the sun set and Angie was nowhere to be found. By 7 p.m., they flagged down a passing police officer and they officially reported Angie Houseman missing. And it's at this point that all hands were on deck. You see, 10 days earlier in nearby Maryland Heights, an 11-year-old girl reported being the victim of an attempted kidnapping when a man grabbed her as she got off of her bus about 3.50 p.m. and dragged her into the bushes. The child successfully fought off the predator and gave police a sketch, but this man had not yet been caught. Immediately, police suspect that Angie's disappearance might be connected to that case. St. Anne police immediately bring in a canine to come and track Angie's scent. If neighbors say they saw Angie, maybe the dog could pick up her scent. Well, they brought in the dog and he followed Angie's scent from the bus stop to about halfway to her house and then her scent vanished in the middle of the road. Police got helicopters involved, the kind with infrared lights. They searched all of the parks in St. Anne and the banks of Coldwater Creek. People were told to look out for Angie. She was nine years old, and she was last seen wearing blue jeans, white tennis shoes, and a long pink coat with a hood. She was also carrying her backpack that was white and blue with a patch of sorts that said Christian Hospital Northeast. Angie weighed about 65 pounds. She had blue eyes and brown hair and a scar on her chin. By the following day, the police had received a ton of calls. Heck, it was something like 300 calls asking or having some sort of information about Angie Houseman. By Saturday, seven FBI agents were on the scene assisting St. Anne police. That day, 20 newly assigned cops reviewed Angie's case to take a look at the evidence or lack thereof with a fresh set of eyes. By now, police were hoping for the best, but fearing the worst, as they recalled a kidnapping from three years earlier in 1990. It was the case of Che Sims, a 12-year-old honor student at Breckenridge Hills who was abducted, raped, murdered, and then disposed of by a creek bed. Her killers were either already in jail or awaiting trial when Angie was taken, but the same panic from back then was taking over all over again. Angie went missing on a Thursday, and by that Monday, the St. Louis Major Case Squad was activated and they got to work. The Major Case Squad consisted of police officers from St. Louis, St. Louis County, and municipalities throughout the area. They usually only investigate homicides, but they made an exception for Angie's case because missing children are always high priority. This was the first time in 28 years that the squad was activated for a non-murder. The last time this occurred was in 1967, when they investigated the rape of a 13-year-old girl in Maplewood. By Tuesday, the media had caught up with Angie's stepfather, Ron, and he told them that the entire family had been through the ringer with nonstop questioning. He understood they were the prime suspects, but he wished they could just move on because it was exhausting. He said they offered him a lie detector test on Monday, and he said, yes, I'll take one. It doesn't matter. He told reporters and cops that he last saw Angie at 8 a.m. when he left for work on the day that she went missing. He was a mechanic at the Sears and Northwest Plaza. He denied any involvement in Angie's disappearance and said, quote, she's my daughter since she was one. I'm hanging on to her as my daughter and she calls me dad, end quote. That night, America's Most Wanted broadcast Angie's picture asking the public for help. By this point, the neighbors, not only in Angie's neighborhood, but everywhere, they were hammering out security plans for the kids which parents would be at the bus stop to make sure everyone got off the bus and made it home safely. A little neighbor friend of Angie was interviewed and he said, quote, we all know Angie. They're all talking about how we want her back real bad. She's our friend, end quote. Angie's friends from school had made a sign that they hung outside Angie's house that read, quote, come home, Angie, we miss you, end quote. Angie's maternal grandmother, Jeanette Bone, was interviewed and she said that psychics were the only ones keeping the family's hopes up. Ron agreed with this statement and offered up that psychics had started calling the house on Saturday and according to one of them, Angie was alive. She was dressed warm and was being fed. And actually, part of this was actually true. 
By Wednesday, Prudential Securities, Inc. offered a $10,000 reward for information leading to Angie's whereabouts. The local VFW was also raising money to offer a reward. Thanksgiving landed on the Thursday, a week after Angie went missing, and still no sign of Angie. By Saturday, November 28, 1993, word on the street was that a little girl had been found dead in the woods. The hush-hush then turned into a scream when police confirmed they found something. That morning at about 11.15 in the morning, a hunter was canvassing the wildlife area west of Miller School Road near Highway 94 and just south of Highway 40 when he discovered a girl tied to a tree. When the hunter called it in, there was an officer nearby, Officer Copeland. He was there within minutes. It was the August A. Bush Wildlife Area in St. Charles County. Investigators swarmed the area, and there she was, a little girl tied to the tree, lifeless. There was snow covering the ground. The child, her identity still unknown, had snow and ice over her naked body. There was one report that said she still had a shirt on, but almost every other report stated that she was nude. The girl had been tied to the tree with blue jeans, and her hands were bound behind her back with metal handcuffs. The girl had duct tape around her eyes and mouth, and inside her mouth were her underwear. They were white with pink frill and had the word Barbie designed all over them with a floral pattern. Police secured the area, and nearby they discovered two bags of what appeared to be evidence. Inside, they found a backpack with a few books with Angie's name inside of them. While the police were certain this was Angie, they had to wait for a positive identification. And by the next day, police told the public the search for Angie had ended. Angie was discovered deceased, and this was now a homicide investigation. Although they never revealed Angie's cause of death, they kept that information close to the chest. And it took them a really long time to reveal this information to the public because they didn't want to ruin the investigation by offering up too much evidence. That same day, the media caught up with Angie's aunt, who told reporters that she was informed that Angie had been shot in the head. But just to clarify, this was not actually the case. But of course, everyone else didn't know that, although the police did quickly step in to reveal that Angie had not actually been shot in the head. Between you and me, I'll tell you this right now, the public was not aware at the time, Angie's cause of death was actually hypothermia. She literally died from the outside elements and the cold. And it's unclear when she was put there in this wildlife area, although it is clear that she was kept alive for a few days after her abduction. The autopsy report sadly revealed that Angie died just hours before she was discovered by that hunter. Police were not shy to tell the public that Angie died a very violent death. They assured the public that there was no definitive link between Angie's murder and the girl's attempted kidnapping a few days earlier, but they were keeping their eyes peeled. The day after Angie's discovery, the media caught up with Angie's biological father, Angelo DeAndre. He told reporters that he loved Angie. He said he couldn't sleep, he cried all the time, and he was straight up angry. He told reporters that he never actually knew Angie, though. You see, Angelo and Diane dated 10 years prior, but once she became pregnant with Angie, she left him. He recalled holding Angie maybe a few times when she was a baby, but other than that, he only watched her grow up from afar. He'd sometimes drive by her house just to watch her playing outside. Now, if you're thinking, um, is anyone looking into this guy? Don't worry. Angelo told reporters that he was already put through the ringer of questioning about Angie's disappearance and murder, but he had nothing to hide. He would never, ever kill his daughter. And he was cleared. Angie's funeral took place on December 2nd, 1993, two weeks after she went missing. She was buried in a pink dress with a pearl necklace. Inside her casket, her family and friends placed pictures of her family, a small Bible, and a teddy bear inside. Before she was buried, they released blue balloons into the sky. Angie's grandmother said, quote, It will be a lonely life for us when we won't be able to see your beautiful face. End quote. Sadly, it was two weeks and investigators were no close to finding Angie's killer. But the major case squad had expanded all their time. So they asked for an extension and it was granted. The St. Anne police chief, Robert Schrader, said, quote, 
This case is heinous enough to stay here until every lead is run out, end quote. And sadly, while the neighbors in St. Anne were celebrating Angie's life and honoring her young soul, a neighboring community was searching for another little girl who had vanished the day prior while walking three blocks to a friend's house. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to have a therapist, someone that you could talk to in a judgment-free zone? Maybe you have thought about it, but you were scared away by the thought of taking the first step, or maybe you thought therapy wasn't affordable. Try Talkspace. By doing virtual therapy, Talkspace has made getting people help easy, accessible, and affordable. Y'all don't know this, but some things in my life recently have really gotten me down. I wasn't quite sure how to get out of the funk. I wasn't sure how to get back up. So I figured I would try therapy because I was sure that it would definitely not make things any worse. And I'm so glad that I tried it. I have found new coping mechanisms to deal with stress and I'm now looking forward to my future. Talkspace makes it easy to find a therapist that you like and it's so convenient to do everything from the comfort of wherever you are because life sometimes gets hectic. Sometimes I take my calls in my office, sometimes I take my calls in the car. Life is mobile and therapy should be too. At Talkspace.com, you can sign up online and get a personalized match with a provider that's right for you. And it's typically done within 48 hours. Talkspace is the number one online therapy platform with licensed therapists in over 40 specialties, including anxiety, depression, relationship issues, and much more. And right now, as a listener of this show, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com slash military murder. To match with a licensed therapist today, visit Talkspace.com slash Military Murder to get $100 off your first month and to show your support for the show. That's Talkspace.com slash Military Murder. This episode was made possible in part by Honey Love. The reviews are in and Honey Love came out on top for best wedding day shapewear. With wedding season upon us, this is the shapewear you've been waiting for. Whether you're a bride, a guest, or just looking for an everyday good fit, Honey Love is your go-to for all things shapewear. I know, I know. When you hear the word shapewear, you probably get an image in your head of not being able to breathe. But that's simply not the case when choosing Honey Love. Their best-selling item is the Super Power Short. And let me tell you, they are glorious. I recently fit into a red dress that I haven't been able to fit into in a long time. But when I put it on, I felt like something was missing. I slipped on my Honey Love Super Power shorts and voila, it held me in in all the right places and sculpted me in areas that needed a little help. And while wearing that red dress, I felt confident and simply blessed. And that's because the Super Power short is created with Honey Love's Signature X, which targets and sculpts your midsection without squeezing your natural curves. Because it's designed to work with your body, not against your body. And the bonus is that Honey Love made it simple to use the bathroom while wearing this piece. I know. It's made with 100% cotton gussette, so you can skip the extra undies and use their convenient opening, which makes it super easy for bathroom use. But comfort doesn't stop at shapewear at Honey Love. They also make comfortable bras, tanks, and leggings. This season, treat yourself to the best shapewear on the market and save 20% off at honeylove.com when you use my code military mama that's 20% off at honeylove.com when you use my code military mama 10-year-old Cassidy Casey Center was a 10-year-old 5th grader at Garrett Elementary School in Hazelwood Missouri just 10 minutes from St. Anne on December 1st 1993 Casey begged her mom to let her go hang christmas lights with her friends who lived a mere 3 blocks away They were three little girls who were sisters and Casey just wanted to go visit them. Casey's mom said yes, but before she let her go, she armed her with a personal alarm. A what? Yes, a personal alarm. It was yellow and small in size, kind of like a beeper or a small transistor radio. The alarm functioned kind of like a panic button. If you pull the string, the alarm sounds really annoying, actually, and in theory would scare off would-be perpetrators. Casey lived on the 12,800 block of Tall Tree Court with her mom. She was walking to the 5,000 block of Tulip Tree Lane. And before she left, her mom warned her to be home by 5 p.m. Ever since Angie had been kidnapped and murdered, 
Kit had been advised to use the buddy system when traveling outside, but Casey and her mom were feeling pretty confident with the personal alarm. The three little girls that Casey was visiting were going to walk and meet Casey halfway, but they changed their minds and instead decided to watch from their window until Casey got to the corner. But they watched and watched and watched, and Casey never showed up. The girls and their mom figured Casey had changed her mind. About 90 minutes later, Casey's mom looked at the clock at 10 past five and realized that Casey wasn't home. She picked up the phone and called Casey's friend. The mom answered and told her, hey, Casey never arrived. What in the world? Casey's mom in the neighborhood and the police soon began to search for Casey. They brought in a scent dog, just like they had done in Angie's case and Casey's scent was tracked to a wooded area in her neighborhood, but there was no Casey. The neighborhood was canvassed and everyone was freaking the hell out. Not another missing girl. Sadly, a neighbor had actually recalled finding Casey's alarm screeching at about 3.40 p.m. And remember, she left her house at 3.30 p.m. So it appeared that Casey met foul play within minutes of stepping outside her house. It's now early December when people should be freaking out about the holidays, but instead people with children were flocking to Radio Shack to buy personal alarms. Radio Shacks were selling out of these things like crazy. A basic personal alarm sold for $10 and one with a flashlight and a motion sensor sold for $15. Security training consultants and mixed martial art instructors, they were getting nonstop questions from parents about child safety. It was off the chain. The day after Casey went missing and after Angie's funeral, Diane Bone, Angie's mother, paid Casey's mom a visit and they embraced as they cried together. By December 10th, Mallinckrodt Medical Inc. offered $50,000 to catch Angie's killer. That same day, Casey's body was discovered in an alley in St. Louis. Her body was wrapped in two comforters and covered with a pink curtain. She had been bludgeoned to death over the head. The community was in shock and Casey's family was devastated. That same day, Leah Nauer published an article in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch where she featured information about John Walsh. John Walsh is famous for being the host of America's Most Wanted. But in 1981, he suffered a great loss. His son, Adam, was abducted from a shopping mall and later found dead. John Walsh dedicated his life to help with cases just like his sons, but he also dedicated his life to finding perpetrators. In profiling these cases, John Walsh said that the typical child killers are remorseless. They're typically loners who prefer sex with children. Often, the child killer has a long history of molestation and sexual assault. He said they are so hard to catch because they don't talk about their crimes. There are usually no witnesses. These men are mobile and repeat their offenses. Now, I want you to keep what John Walsh has said here in the back of your mind, because when they eventually find Angie's killer, John's description is spot on, over and above what the FBI or the police profile says. It's now mid-December of 1993. Everyone was talking about the buddy system. They were saying children should never be without adult supervision, and if they have to be, then they should roll in packs, which honestly is always a good idea. At this point, police are now looking for two killers, the person who killed Angie and the person who killed Casey. Now, police are not completely sure if it's maybe the same killer, so the cases were investigated separately as they should be. I'm going to focus on Angie's case for now as I continue. The police go on to profile the child killer or killers as follows. They believe that it's someone who lives alone or whose roommate just moved out or is away for an extended period of time. They believe it's a white male between the ages of 20 and 45 years old, a person who recently lost a job or a loved one. This person is intelligent but holds a menial job and has several vehicles that they can switch on and off from. But with that, the rest of 1993 is quiet and closes out without any arrest in the murders of Angie Houseman and Casey Center. 1994 rolls around and an arrest was made but not in Angie's case and not in Casey's case. Remember that attempted abduction that occurred a few days before Angie went missing? Well, an arrest was made in that case. It was 37-year-old Gary Stufflebean. He's from Spring, Texas and worked as a corporate auditor. 
He lived in Austin but traveled often to St. Louis on business trips and to visit family. Gary was arrested in mid-December of 1993, but we didn't really hear about it and he hadn't been released on bail. He was charged with sexual abuse and attempted kidnapping and he admitted to sexually assaulting four different girls, but he denied any involvement in Angie and Casey's case. And well, on January 7th, 1994, the police announced that Gary had been cleared in the two murder cases. It turns out he was cleared using travel records, coworker statements, and electronic password systems. And all of the evidence showed he was nowhere near St. Louis during those abductions and subsequent murders. Gary was released on bail and one of his victim's mom, no kidding, showed up at Gary's mom's house wanting to talk with him. But Gary's wife was there and she was standing by her man. She thought he was innocent and she wouldn't let the woman in. And the two women, the mom of the victim and Gary's wife, actually got into a shoving match. Anyway, Gary Stuffelbean ultimately pled guilty and was sentenced to five years in prison. So at least for now, one case was closed. In February of 1994, another case's investigation would soon come to an end. You see, on February 3rd, 1994, an arrest was made in Casey Center's abduction and murder. One of her neighbors, whose name was Thomas Brooks, was charged with kidnapping and murder in Casey's case. Well, what happened was, when Casey's body was discovered in the alley in St. Louis, detectives noticed distinct tire marks near the scene. They eventually concluded that these tire marks came from a U-Haul truck. So police went back to Casey's neighborhood and asked around, hey, had anyone seen a U-Haul truck? And someone actually recalled seeing a U-Haul at a neighbor's house within a week of Casey's disappearance. So police knock on this neighbor's door and a woman answered. She said she had no idea about a U-Haul truck and she didn't know or see anything about Casey. She lived with her brother, Thomas, and another man. And they were all questioned and they all denied a connection to Casey. But somehow police obtained a search warrant and wouldn't you know it, Casey's blood was inside the house. Also inside was the murder weapon, the blunt force object that killed Casey. Thomas Brooks was questioned and at first he denied any involvement, but eventually he broke and this is the story he told. After Casey left her house on her way to her friend's house, she actually made a pit stop by the Brooks house looking for his young nephews. Thomas let Casey into the house. It's unclear who else was home, but instead of leading her to his nephews, he led her to the basement of the home where he tried to sexually assault her. When Casey panicked and screamed like crazy, Thomas grabbed the bed slat and hit Casey over the head multiple times until she stopped screaming and until she was dead, which means that Casey was dead within 15 minutes of leaving her house. Thomas had to go to work that day, so he covered Casey's body and left her in the basement. After he returned, his sister told Thomas something to the effect of, I don't want to know about what I just saw downstairs, but you better get rid of it. While this conversation is happening inside the Brooks home, outside that very house, dozens, maybe hundreds of people were searching for Casey Center. A week later on December 8th, remember Casey vanished on the 1st, Thomas rented a U-Haul truck. While Casey's body was still wrapped and in that basement, he placed her on a dolly and rolled her onto the truck to not appear suspicious. Then Thomas drove to St. Louis and dumped her body in the alley. Thomas Brooks did ultimately have his day in court in 1995, where he was convicted and sentenced to death. He subsequently died, however, in 2000 from complication from the AIDS virus. The investigation into Angie's murder was still hot and heavy. On February 8th, 1994, police released a composite sketch of a man who was seen in Angie's neighborhood around the time she went missing. Police told the public that the man in the sketch was seen driving a blue car. And the same day that they put out this composite sketch, a woman came forward with the darndest story. She remembered something weird. 
Two days before Angie's body was discovered back in 1993, this woman was at a Thanksgiving gathering when a news report came on the television. After the news report aired about Angie Houseman, a 13-year-old boy who was present at this Thanksgiving feast mentioned the weirdest dream he recently had. The little boy mentioned that Angie would be discovered in the Bush Wildlife Area. The woman hadn't really thought anything of it since Angie had not yet been found. But after hearing the news report all those months later and the mention of the blue car, the woman found it odd because at Thanksgiving, that same little boy also mentioned something about a blue car when talking about Angie. While this tip sounded extremely odd, the police had to follow up because what in the hell? Police pay this boy a visit and he's home alone. So police questioned him and the boy said that the only reason he knew about it was because he had a dream. But police were not buying it. So they ask him to take a ride with them and they take him to the wildlife area where Angie was discovered. And they say, hey, where was she found? By now, of course, all the evidence tape was gone. And the boy kind of walks around and he pointed to a location and police's hopes begin to dim because it's in the general vicinity, but not close enough that they thought the boy knew what he was talking about. Police got permission from the court to obtain the boy's fingerprints and hair samples. And when compared to those found at the scene, they were not a match. Turns out that this eighth grader really did just have a dream. His mother later confirmed that dream telling tended to run in their family. The cops totally rolled their eyes. One cop even told a reporter, quote, it's easier for me to believe that somebody told the kid something. I mean, a dream, a dream. This is the craziest thing I've been involved in, end quote. For five years, the investigation into Angie Hausman's murder was quiet. And then in November of 1995, they announced that a St. Louis anonymous businessman donated $250,000 reward for information leading to Angie's murderer. The previous reward was in a trust and it was about to expire on December 1st, 1999. Everyone was hopeful that this new reward might lead to an arrest, but people in the business know that cash rewards rarely help solve murders. A year and a half went by without much information. And then in May of 2001, police believe they might have a break in the case. An inmate pending charges for murder has just confessed to 10 murders, one of those being little Angie Hausman. You can actually watch a part of this guy's confession in the episode of On the Case with Paula Zahn, and it is so sickening to listen to his confession. The man's name is Corey Fox. He looks like a wise guy, and he basically said that he didn't act alone. It was him and another guy he called Virgil. He said they convinced Angie to get into his car after school one day. She had a green textbook and some papers in her backpack. Once they had Angie in the car, they took her to Virgil's home and there they held her for three days. He said that Angie made multiple attempts to escape, so they removed her clothes from the waist down to keep her from running. Well, police asked Corey what kind of underwear Angie was wearing, and he said pink underwear with white frill and the Barbie symbol all over it. Corey said their original plan was to kidnap Angie and ask for ransom. But as the days went by, Virgil became paranoid that Angie would recognize them. So they decided to dispose of her. They tied her to a tree in a wooded area off Highway 70. Angie did not go quietly, however. So they put duct tape on her mouth and eyes. Police pressed further. Did anything else happen before the duct tape was placed on Angie's mouth? And Corey remembered that since Angie was screaming, Virgil saw her underwear on the floor and he put them in her mouth before covering her mouth with duct tape. Then they left her out in the cold to die. After Corey's confession, detectives were stunned. Did this guy actually do this? Overall, the story seemed to add up, but they needed to make sure he wasn't just seeking attention or attempting to remove the focus from the murder he was actually accused of committing. Detectives press further. They want to know all the details. And it's then that Corey's story began to fall apart. They asked him what types of handcuffs Angie had on, and he said they were plastic, kind of like toy cuffs. Wrong. They were legit metal handcuffs. There was also some discrepancy in what Angie was wearing when she was last seen. 
Almost as soon as they got their hopes up, their hopes were deflated. Police knew Corey Fox was a liar. Sadly, the Angie Houseman investigative team spent hundreds of man hours following these Corey Fox leads, only to end up at square one. Corey Fox was definitely a piece of work. He ultimately pled guilty to the underlying murder of stabbing a man named Don Kapal, and he was sentenced to life plus 30. But wait, that's not all for Corey Fox. I went sleuthing about him for some ungodly reason, and it turned out that years later, in 2009 to be exact, Corey Fox was used to bunking alone in prison, and one day he was told that he would be getting a bunkmate. He told guards, if you give me a bunkmate, I will kill that person. But the guards called his bluff. And wouldn't you know it, Corey Fox, no kidding, murdered his bunkmate using a braided bedsheet. The inmate who he murdered was a man named Joshua D. And this guy was weeks shy of leaving prison for a robbery or something like that. Joshua D.'s family ended up suing and the state settled for $150,000. In the summer of 2002, tensions in the St. Louis region were high again after a little six-year-old girl named Casey Williamson was abducted and murdered in nearby Valley Park, which is about 25 minutes from St. Anne. Casey's killer was found within hours of her murder and the killer neighbor confessed to walking into Casey's house and carrying her away from her home as everyone inside slept. But even with Casey's murderer captured, Casey's abduction and murder led to remembering all of the unsolved kid cases in the region. And the newspaper listed a few of them. In 1999, there was the disappearance of 12-year-old Heather Colorn from Richmond Heights. There was the 1998 disappearance of 9-year-old Jean Mexo, who vanished from Belleville. Then there was a 1991 disappearance of 11-year-old Arlen Henderson, who vanished while riding his bike near Moscow Mills in Lincoln County. Five more years went by with little mention of Angie Hausman. But in 2007, Angie's memory soon resurfaced when in January of 2007, a teenage boy named Ben Ownsby was kidnapped from a bus stop in Franklin County. Someone in Ben's neighborhood recognized a strange vehicle in the area, and eventually that tip led detectives to an apartment complex in Kirkwood a few days after the abduction. And when police made entry into the suspect's home, they were shocked. Not only did they find 11-year-old Ben, but they also found Sean Hornback. Sean had been kidnapped four years earlier when he was only 11 years old. Sean had been riding his bike when a man knocked him off the bike and took him. The man kept Sean as his sex slave, basically for all those years. And well, turns out that Sean was getting a little too old for the kidnapper's taste. So that's when he struck again and kidnapped Ben. Both Ben and Sean were alive when rescued by police. The kidnapper was Michael Devo Devlin. He was a pizza restaurant manager. The city dubbed the recovery of the two young boys the Missouri Miracle. The perpetrator ultimately pled guilty to kidnapping and sexual assault and was sentenced to 74 life sentences in Missouri prison and 170 years of federal time. Sadly, the Missouri Miracle opened up old wounds about Angie Hausman. In 2008, unbeknownst to the public, though, detectives decided to relook at a man who was parked near Angie's murder scene when she was discovered. That man's name was Roger Martin. When police initially interviewed this Roger cat at the scene, they asked him why he was parked in such a remote area and he said he was a hunter. But when police looked around his vehicle, they didn't see any hunting weapons, which was odd. But at the time, police didn't question him any further. But years later, when they relooked at the file, they looked into Roger's background and he had quite the rap sheet, including, get this, sexually related offenses with a minor. What? How could detectives have missed this? Before police approach Roger Martin, they follow up with one of his victims 
And when they discover that one of his crimes occurred on Miller School Road, which is near Angie's discovery site, police want to talk to him, stat. They bring Roger Martin into the station, and this interview is recorded, and parts of it are shown on the case with Paula Zahn. Detectives ask Roger what he was doing at the site where Angie was found, and he said something to the effect of, wrong place, wrong time. They show him a picture of Angie, and he said he's never seen the girl. But whenever they take the picture out, he always seemed to get like real squirrely, which makes the detectives really confused. When they asked Roger where he was at the time of Angie's abduction, he said he was at work, but this alibi didn't check out. Well, detectives offer Roger a voice stress test and he agreed to take it, but according to the show, he failed it. And that's when they took his fingerprints to see if they matched the fingerprints on the duct tape found on Angie. And it turns out it was not a match. After nine hours of interrogation, police do not have enough to arrest Roger and they start to think that maybe he didn't have anything to do with it. And with that, they remove yet another suspect from the lineup. In 2013, there was a major piece written by Bill McClellan in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. In this piece, he memorialized the 20-year anniversary of Angie's abduction and murder. The piece was written to get people talking again. But sadly, it would be another quiet six years for the public. But behind the scene, detectives were still busting their romps. The prosecutor was eager to solve this case because Angie Hausman's case was at this point part of the fabric of the St. Louis community and everyone just wanted answers. So they opened a new task force to relook at Angie's case. By this point, they thought that DNA had come such a long way that they might be able to get a DNA profile from some of the evidence. A man named Brian Crew was a forensic specialist, and he said that he spent over a decade searching for touch DNA on three of the items found at Angie's crime scene. Specifically, he looked at the handcuffs, the duct tape, and Angie's underwear. They were really hopeful about the duct tape because, you know, it's so sticky. I mean, Have you ever dealt with duct tape? It's just so hard not to get your fingerprints on it. But when they went to test the duct tape, they opened up the evidence bag and wouldn't you know it, the sticky part of the duct tape, the important part that I was just talking about, well, after all these years, it had turned to dust. So it was useless. When they moved on to the handcuffs, they couldn't get a good enough DNA result because Angie's blood was covering the handcuffs. Yet another setback in this horrible case. Finally, forensic experts turned to Angie's underwear. For years, Angie's underwear were out of the question as far as getting a usable DNA profile. You see, Angie's underwear contained fabric dye, D-Y-E, which could have altered the DNA. So it was never tested until technology had improved enough that now you could test items that had been dyed a different color without fear of it altering the DNA sample and losing that tiny bit of potential evidence. So they tested the underwear and they had to wait and wait and wait and wait. But in 2019, DNA testing from Angie's underwear came back and they were able to confirm a male DNA profile in her underwear. And that DNA find blew this case wide open. When they run the DNA profile through CODIS, the criminal database, they are almost immediately stunned. The profile matches a man named Earl Cox Jr., a man who is already serving time in North Carolina. But wait, I'll get there. The two detectives, Lankford and Copeland, who had been working Angie's case for the last two decades, they swore that they would never retire until Angie's case was solved. They were both contacted when they pinpointed a guy in her case and they both broke down. All their hard work had finally paid off. So you're probably wondering, who in the hell is Earl Cox Jr.? And here it is. Earl 
Cox Jr. was born on July 17, 1957, to Louise and Earl Cox Sr. Earl's father died when he was only 12 years old. He was born and raised in the St. Louis area. In middle school, he was part of the yearbook staff and part of the JV baseball team. Earl graduated from high school in 1975, and he immediately joined the Air Force. His first duty assignment was in Rhineman, Germany. He served with the 435th Combat Support Group. While in Germany, Earl babysat as a side hustle until in 1980 when four kids he babysat reported he sexually abused them. Earl was forced to face a general court-martial, a.k.a. a trial, in Germany for his crimes against these children. In 1982, at just 24 years old, Earl was convicted of sodomy, indecent liberties, and assault involving girls under the age of 16. He was sentenced by the military to a dishonorable discharge, eight years in prison, reduction to E1, and total forfeitures. And then he was sent to Leavenworth. But after serving just three years of his eight-year sentence, Earl received parole in 1985 and he returned to Missouri. Between 88 and 89, a few girls reported that Earl had sexually abused them and charges were brought against him. But by 1991, for unknown reasons, those charges were dropped. Even though the civilians were not pursuing any action in that case, the military considered this a violation of parole and they sent Earl back to Leavenworth, where he served an entire year behind bars. He got out of Leavenworth prison in December of 1992 and returned to St. Louis, Missouri. Sadly, his sister and mother lived close to Angie's abduction site, which is what brought his sorry ass into the area. Earl stayed in the St. Louis area for a few years, and sometime in the late 1990s, he transplanted to Colorado Springs, Colorado. There really isn't mention of what he did for work either in St. Louis or Colorado Springs. But I do have information on some more illegal stuff that Earl got himself into. Let's fast forward to January 10th of 2003. Earl Cox Jr. was at a Greyhound bus stop in Pueblo, Colorado. Pueblo is a small town south of Colorado Springs. Earl was waiting for someone at the bus stop, but instead of this someone, the FBI showed up, asked him if he was Earl, and he said yes, and boom, they arrested him. Turns out that our boy Earl was waiting for a young girl he believed to be 14 years old. You see, Earl had been on an internet chat room for teens when he met a 14-year-old girl from Virginia. He got to chatting with her and through conversations, they became a little too friendly. Earl asked the girl to move down to live with him in Colorado, and according to him, he wanted her to be his sex slave. And the young girl agreed. Earl mailed the girl $60 for a bus ticket, and he was at the bus stop to meet with her. Unbeknownst to him, the girl on the other side of that chat conversation was actually the FBI. Got him. Of course, after Earl's arrest, they got a search warrant for his house and his computer and the police were not ready for what they would discover. I don't know, maybe they were. When they searched his computer, he had a whopping 45,000 plus images of child pornography, ranging from babies less than one year old all the way up into adolescence. If you need a minute to vomit, I 100% understand. But wait, sadly, there is more. Not only was Earl a consumer of this disgusting content, he was already on authorities' radar in the United Kingdom. You see, the UK National High Tech Crime Unit had been investigating a huge child pornography ring. It was a website slash chat room called The Shadows, with a Z at the end, Brotherhood, The Shadows Brotherhood. I didn't Google if this was a website or a chat room because I'm really not interested on in being on some child pornography watch list. I am pretty sure I'm already on a watch list for all the murder stuff that I look up online, and I do not want to be involved in any of that. Anyhow, this brotherhood popped up on the World Wide Web in 1997, and one of the leaders of this website was known as The Wizard. And surprise, surprise, The Wizard was Earl Cox Jr. himself. Newspaper clippings from Earl's arrest and subsequent trial for these offenses indicate that, quote, to become an administrator for the Shadows Brotherhood chat board, one had to post some form of child pornography to the board, preferably 
a live broadcast of the individual having sex with his minor daughter or some newly produced images of a child engaged in sexually explicit conduct to have never been posted before, end quote. This type of initiation, according to the newspaper clipping that I saw, was a way to keep undercover agents from becoming ring members. Earl was 45 years old at the time of his 2003 arrest. He and another guy named Timothy Adarowich, who was 53 at the time, were in cahoots with this whole chat room thing. That mofo did some pretty awful things as well. With all the evidence that the FBI discovered, Earl was charged with attempting to entice a minor to travel in interstate commerce for sexual activity, using the mail for attempting to entice a minor, possessing more than 10 child pornography videos, and receiving child pornography. During his federal trial, Earl tried to say that he took to the internet because it was his only relief. He was really a loner and it was a way for him to make friendships. Ugh, disgusting. His attorney had the gall, I mean the gall, to tell the court that Earl was not a child predator. He took the bait by this undercover FBI agent pretending to be a 14-year-old. As always, the attorney tried to make it seem like Earl would never have initiated any type of connection with a 14-year-old, but for that conniving FBI agent. But the prosecutor was ready for that line of argument, so they pinpointed to, I don't know, the prior child sexual abuse convictions from his time in the Air Force when he babysat people's kids and abused them? This mother f- By the way, the name of the chat room where he met this 14-year-old was called Teen Flirt. Why in the hell is a 45-year-old man in a Teen Flirt chat room? Oh, wait, oh, wait, let me guess. He wanted to warn the girls to stay away from bad guys. Yeah, buddy, we've heard that argument before. By the way, can I just say that the amount of these types of creeps that serve in the military is actually appalling. I mean, the same can be said for the civilian sector, but really it makes you wonder who your neighbor is and what they do on their computer. And you're probably wondering, why did it take so long? This website showed up in 1997 and he didn't get caught till 2003 because of something else. So what took so long for them to bust this network? Well, it had taken so long to bust this network of creeps because their website and chat rooms had sophisticated encryption techniques. Needless to say, the Earl's arrest and the subsequent search of his computer led to the arrest of men in over four countries, including the U.S., Canada, Germany, and the United Kingdom. For his crimes in Colorado, Earl was sentenced to a whopping 10 years in prison, which personally is not enough time. In 2011 or 2012, around that time frame, Earl was set to be released from prison. But wait, he underwent some sort of psychological evaluation where the doctors reported that Earl was likely to reoffend. So they did a crazy, albeit legal thing. They involuntarily committed Earl under the Adam Walsh Act, which became law in 2006. Now, if you're interested in checking it out, you can find the Adam Walsh Act at 18 U.S. Code 4248. And y'all, did I learn a new thing doing research for this case? I found a presentation by a federal litigator and public defender, and this is what I learned about the Adam Walsh Act. The Adam Walsh Act allows for the civil commitment of sexually dangerous persons. Sexually dangerous is defined as a person who has engaged or attempted to engage in sexually violent conduct or child molestation and who is sexually dangerous to others. Sexually dangerous to others means the person suffers from a serious mental illness, abnormality, or disorder as a result of which he would have serious difficulty in refraining from sexually violent conduct or child molestation if released. There's a three-pronged test that goes along with this. The first prong is that there must be a prior offense, sexual nature. Child pornography alone is not enough, but it, indecent exposure can count. The second prong is there has to be a serious mental illness. You have to think like pedophilia. And prong three is serious difficulty refraining from committing these crimes. Think multiple hand-on offenses, the length of time between these offenses, and the length of time without committing these offenses. 
Now, getting someone involuntarily committed is really not that simple, though. There are interviews, evaluations, expert defense counsels, judges, and ultimately, if someone is involuntarily committed, there are challenges and appeals. By the way, Earl argued every single year after his commitment that he should be let go, not because he has been rehabbed, but because according to him, quote, he was too sick to reoffend, end quote. Ugh, too sick, my ass. All that to say that Earl Cox Jr. underwent all of this and was committed and placed in a prison in North Carolina, where he sat until the DNA found on Angie's underwear came back as a match to him. Remember earlier where I talked about John Walsh and what he said early on about child sexual predators? Well, who would have thunk that all these years later, John Walsh's hard work would pay off in this particular case? And let me just add real quickly here that the Adam Walsh Act became law on the 25th anniversary of John Walsh's son's disappearance and murder, which is just truly so sad. In 2019, Missouri detectives paid our boy Earl a visit in North Carolina. They chatted with him about Angie Houseman, but he refused to talk. He just straight up was like, I'm not talking about it, which is odd considering he didn't even try to lie about it. So prosecutors back in Missouri put the case together and they realized not only did they have his DNA, but Earl was most definitely in the area and he had the opportunity to commit the crime. They really wanted him to confess to this, however, but by then Earl had lawyered up. Prosecutors went to Earl's defense counsel and basically said, we're going to seek the death penalty for your boy unless we get something from him. And that was a carrot they needed. And Earl ended up confessing. Now, by all accounts, Earl's confession was self-serving. But this is what he said happened. On November 18th, 1993, he was driving down the road when he started to have car trouble. He got out to check it out. Just then, a school bus full of kids let out. Angie walked by his car and approached him, making conversation. Yeah, I'm sure you're crazy, old man. Angie walked by his car and approached him, making conversation. He talked to her for a little bit and asked her if she was cold, and she said yes. He told her to get into his car, and she did. He then got into the car and drove off. Reports say that he then took her to Burger King because she said she was hungry, and then he drove around for a while, not quite sure what to do. Then he decided to take her to his house in Wentzville. There, he sexually assaulted her and kept her captive for a few days. Earl never gave a definitive amount of days that he kept her captive, but he did admit to the sexual assault. Eventually, for unknown reasons, he took her out to the wildlife area and tied her to a tree where he left her to die. Earl's confession was very dry and he never showed remorse for what he did to Angie. Earl was extradited to Missouri, where he pled guilty to first-degree murder and first-degree sexual assault. When given an opportunity to talk to Angie's family and friends, Earl chose to stay silent. In sentencing him to life in prison without the possibility of parole, St. Charles County Circuit Judge John A. Cunningham told Earl, quote, Your crimes not only terrified Angie and her family, but the entire community, end quote. Outside the courtroom, Ron Bone, Angie's stepfather, but also the man who stood in place of her father since she was one, told reporters, quote, He ought to be in for two murders. He killed my wife. She might have died from cancer, but she died a long time ago. It just tore her up, end quote. Sadly, Diane Bone died of cancer three years shy of the world learning the identity of Angie's killer. Ron Jr., Angie's brother, who was only two when she was murdered, he also spoke. He told reporters that while he was a young boy when Angie died, he remembered that she was his best friend. He said the family was never the same after losing Angie. And he also spoke candidly that his mother really lost the will to live after that and that he had to stop his mother from harming herself. While Diane died four years before Earl was sentenced for her daughter's death, reporter Aaron Heffernan with the St. Louis Post-Dispatch remembered back in the 90s when Diane told them that she always kept the porch light on, saying, quote, when they find the killer and put him in jail, that's when the lights go off, end quote. 
But Earl's story is not yet over because authorities were not yet done with him. Remember those charges that were dropped back in 88 and 89? The ones that caused him to spend an additional year at Leavenworth? Well, the prosecutor revived those charges. Yup, that victim would also get her day in court. According to reporting by Joel Courier, in March of 2021, Earl entered an Alford plea to four counts of sodomy for molesting a seven-year-old girl in the late 1980s in St. Anne. For his crimes, he was sentenced to 10 years per charge to be served concurrently, which means at the same time. The victim in that 1980s case, or really, I'm going to call her the survivor with all caps, well, she had something to say. She said at his trial, quote, For me, tomorrow another day will come, and after that another will come. But for this sorry excuse for a human, today it ends. I will go on with my amazing life, with my amazing family, and you will rot in a lonely jail cell. No family, no friends, and most importantly, no more victims. I'm speaking to you as an advocate for all victims. We are strong and we are fierce. And today, justice will be served for the crimes that you committed against me. If there's anything that I want heard today, it's that I was a victim. And I emphasize was. But I have overcome that and I will continue to be successful. And I will continue to advocate for victims and speak out to have justice served. When I tell you that I struggled to muster everything in me to do this case, you just know that I almost didn't do it. Not because I didn't want to, but because these cases really take a toll on the entire community. And the sad reality is that criminals like Earl Cox Jr. go unreported more than I would care to think. Thank you all for listening, and I am so sorry that I have ruined your day. Just a reminder that I am going live tonight on TikTok at 9 p.m. Central. You can find me there at Military Margot with a T at the end. And I really hope that you'll stop by just to say hi. This show was created by Mama Margot Productions. Shout out to all of the show producers, a.k.a. Patreon fan club members. Executive producers for this episode include Nicole G, Falcon 13, Alicia, Jen, Tina, Ryan and Bob. Newest associate producers are Amanda, Kirsten, Imtithal, and Shelby. Newest assistant producers are Ashanti, Daryl, Joe, Jocelyn, Kayla, and Denise. The music was created by Tyops. Thank you and shout out to all of my dotted line contributors. I love you all. Until next time, remember, you never really know what someone is capable of. So remain vigilant always. You have a fabulous week and I'll keep digging to bring you another military murder story next time. working on our podcast. I don't want to.